pathologies. So here at the Bell Museum, we have an exhibit on some pretty serious conditions, and some of them you might not even think about. Hi, my name is Basha here at the Bell Museum, and today we're going to take a look at our pathology exhibit. Quick vocab lesson. Pathology means the study of the cause and effect of medical conditions. So let's take a look at some of the effects. Leprosy is an infectious disease which affects the nervous system, skin, and bones. Obviously, this is the Bone Museum after all. It destroys pain receptors, making one unable to feel pain, and also causes lesions on the skin which can become infected. Now, if the lesions do become infected, because of the effect on the nervous system, the person is unable to feel the pain of the infection, so eventually causes complete bone destruction and resorption. Now, if this looks like a completely normal skull to you, let's turn it. Do you see anything missing? What's missing in this skull is the entire nose ridge. The entire nose, including the septum, is completely gone. And this is a typical skull for comparison. Now, the most common attribute seen in leprosy is the destruction of extremities and digits, such as the fingers, toes, and the nose. So all of this happens and the person can't even feel it. Rickets. Rickets is a severe vitamin D deficiency which causes the bones to become weak, brittle, and soft. Most often, rickets is observed in people from more northern countries that don't get much sunlight because you do get a lot of your vitamin D from the sun. You may leave your vitamin D jokes in the comments now. In more severe cases, the bones will become so soft that they will actually warp. And that's why in babies, they usually do a check where they see if the thighs are bowed to check for rickets. Now, rickets is most commonly observed in children and not just because of low sun exposure. Babies get their vitamin D from the mother or the mother's breast milk. But if the mother is also vitamin D deficient, then the baby will in turn also become vitamin D deficient. You can see here, because the skull was softer due to the rickets, it's a little bit more flattened back here. Moving on. This is the femur of an individual that had polio. Polio is an infectious disease which can, in rare cases, uh, cause paralysis. Paralytic polio is rare, with only about 1% of polio cases resulting in paralysis. But when they do, it can cause this. The paralytic polio will cause something called disuse osteoporosis, which causes your bones to atrophy due to the lack of use. Now, because of the prosthetics that they would use during polio, because the bones still had so much pressure on them, even though they weren't really able to withstand it, it would cause bone warping. Now, this is a typical femur, one that has not been affected by polio. And now you're gonna notice that this one is extremely thin. And hey, I also said that there was warping, right? Well, if we take the femurs and we turn the head of the femur, which is the top rounded part, the same direction, and we follow the femur all the way down to the femoral condyle, we're gonna see that the one on the polio femur is not facing the same direction. Polio was a big epidemic in the United States in the 19th century until the 1950s when a vaccine was finally discovered. Vaccinate your kids. Moving on. Why do I have these two things together? Both of these came from individuals with achondroplasia. Achondroplasia is a condition which results in a short stature due to a mutation in the FGFR3 gene. People of short stature will typically have a normal sized torso, but shorter limbs and a large head. And also typically the frenum magnum, which is also called the big hole in Latin, is typically also smaller, which can cause nerve compression. People with short stature are more prone to various medical conditions, such as nerve compression, as we've already covered, arthritis, and degenerative joint conditions, which we see here. If we take a look at the top of the humerus right here, yes, this is a humerus, we can see that it's really shiny and polished. This is due to something called ubernation. When the joint that cushions the bones from each other gets worn down, it causes the bones to grind against each other, eventually polishing it down to the smooth and almost ivory-like appearance. Here's a typical humerus for reference, not only just for size reference, but also to look at the top of the humerus here to see just how ground down this is. Moving on. This is a result of an orbital tumor. As you can see here, whatever tumor this was, it completely eroded the entire eye socket as well as half the nose. It's really hard to narrow down exactly which tumor or cancer would have caused this, but I think that the skull just speaks for itself. And just like that, moving on. This is a skull with syphilis. And this is the back of a skull with syphilis. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease which in late stages can make its way to the bone. And don't worry, the infection is long dead. 
Now, when syphilis makes its way to the bone, it's called tertiary syphilis, and it starts breaking it down. This patterning on the back of the skull is called cari sicca, and it's your body's way of fighting the syphilis. When the syphilis breaks down the bone, your body goes in and tries to repair it, basically creating this kind of scar tissue texture on the skull. As you can see, the human body is wild. And remember class, syphilis is treatable with penicillin, not sponsored. As interesting as the skull is, we're moving on. This is an abnormally thick skull, like really thick. Skull thickening can happen for a couple reasons, including chronic ventricular shunting for hydrocephalus, as well as idiopathic, which just means that we don't know why it happens, happens for no reason, your body just does that. This skull is actually really light. And in case you're wondering, what is chronic ventricular shunting for hydrocephalus or what is hydrocephalus? Moving on. Well, it's this. This is hydrocephalus, also known as water on the brain. Hydrocephalus occurs when the ventricles inside your brain get overfilled with cerebrospinal fluid, which is the fluid that lives inside your spine. It's most commonly found in children, and what happens is with the excess fluid, it puts pressure on the skull, causing it to expand. Now you can see here that the forehead is pretty protruding and the head is quite large. Usually I can get my full hand around the skull, but with this one, it takes two. If you look at these two side by side, you can see just how large it is. Yeah, just take a look at the difference in the forehead here, how protruding this one is. Now, the chronic ventricular shunting that I mentioned before is actually the procedure that's used to treat hydrocephalus. It's like a 30-minute procedure which involves placing a shunt that goes from the skull into the abdomen, which drains out the cerebral spinal fluid, and then your body just absorbs it. Now that your questions have been answered, moving on. This unassuming little rib is actually incredibly rare. This is called a bifid rib or a bifurcated rib or a Lushka's rib. So many names. This is a congenital condition, which means that a person is born with it and it's also asymptomatic, which means that they have no idea that they have it. Best of both worlds. This occurs in the fetal developmental stage. So when the rib is getting formed, sometimes it will splinter at the end here and then the splinter will grow into basically a second rib. Two for one. Only about 1% 1 of the population has this condition. So if you know that you have it, please call us. So if you know that you have it, we're taking you to the museum. Now that we've seen the ultra rare piece, are we moving on? Nope, that's the end of the video. That's all you get to see. But if you would like to see more, make sure to visit us at the Bone Museum in Brooklyn, New York and follow our socials for more incredible bone content.